you very much, Olga, for that nice introduction. Thank you also to you and to the other organisers for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm very honoured, in fact, to be opening this conference. I hope I can live up to expectations. Um, I'd like to begin with a couple of disclaimers. The first one is that though this is a linguistics conference, I'm not actually a proper linguist, really. Um, as Olga mentioned, my specialist area is translation studies, which is somewhat schizophrenic as a discipline. It draws on many different areas. And so I've actually got one foot in linguistics, another one in literary studies, another one in cultural studies. It gives me three feet. <laughs> it's not a good start. But, um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm saying this because um, I want to warn you that my, my talk is not going to be particularly technical in linguistic terms and it's also going to be informed by some culturalist and philosophical issues. Um, my second disclaimer is that uh, what I'm going to say today is not particularly new. As you'll hear, I'm drawing upon works which have been around for a couple of decades or more. Um, and I myself have been talking around this general theme for a while now, though not, not exactly what I'm going to say today. Um, but I do feel that what I have to say is more relevant than ever. Because, if anything, English academic discourse's status as the um, only acceptable vehicle for knowledge in the modern world is increasing by the day. Um, all around the world, in universities, courses are sprouting up to teach it. Um, more and more manuals are being published codifying it. There are more and more linguistics journals appearing to study it, to specialise in it, and conferences being held on it. Um, and this results in a discrediting of other ways of encoding knowledge in a process which I have elsewhere termed epistemicide. So it's my contention that the prestige of English academic discourse actually rests upon a premise that is fundamentally false. Um, because it presents itself as a neutral vehicle of objective fact. It claims that by using clearly defined terms, straightforward syntax, by carefully avoiding the overt manipulation of the reader, it can offer a transparent window onto some pre-existing reality. But I will argue here, not only is this philosophically untenable, it is also a rhetorical ploy designed to reinforce the status of a particular form of knowledge at the expense of others. Um, I think it's probably useful to begin by defining our terms. Uh, what do we mean by English academic discourse? Um, it is fashionable today, of course, to talk about academic discourses in the plural, to emphasise the differences that undoubtedly exist between different disciplinary areas, different academic genres. Uh, between novice writers who feel probably that they have to stick rigidly to the patterns laid down in star manuals and expert writers who have achieved a lot more flexibility and the freedom to develop their own voice. However, I would argue that these are only nuances or surface variants of a discourse that is so ubiquitous uh, that in the Anglo-Saxon world it's scarcely viewed as a discourse at all. And this is because all mainstream academic writing in English, mainstream, um, shares the same fundamental principles, the same epistemological attitude. Now between uh, 2004 and 2009, I undertook a survey of the style manuals available on the market. And of the literally hundreds that are available, I actually studied carefully 41 of them in order to try to, to gauge the kind of advice that was being offered. And what I found was that despite the fact that these were aiming at very different publics, some were for undergraduates, some were for postgraduates, some were for, for established researchers, some were for native speakers in English, some were for foreigners, some were for 
specialising in different genres, such as the research article or the dissertation, others were more general, others were disciplinary specific, <coughs> some were, again were more general. Despite all of these differences, uh, they all said much the same thing. There were a few very minor disciplinary variations, such as a preference for personal or impersonal forms, but aside of this, they were all oriented by the same basic principles. Clarity, economy, precision, straightforward syntax, clearly defined lexics with a preference for concrete terms over abstractions, and structured rational arguments supported by evidence. They were also united by a distrust of overt rhetoric. Many of the manuals explicitly warned against the manipulation of the reader. As you see, we've got Fairburn and Winch saying, avoid dubious persuasive techniques such as emotive language. Hennessy, avoid false syllogisms, begging the question, sweeping generalizations, emotionally weighted language, non secateurs Neil, avoid non-rational argument. Cottrell, clearly distinguish between fact and opinion. Macmillan and Ways, avoid value judgments. Um, implying then that the only licit form of persuasion is straightforward demonstration and rational argument. So I think from this we can deduce that the purpose of English academic discourse is to transmit factual information about some aspect of the outside world as clearly, concisely, and precisely as possible. And from this perspective, wordiness, just like the use of emotivity and these overt rhetorical devices, only serve to obfuscate. Now this might seem self-evident to some people, but it does presuppose a certain, certain epistemological principles that perhaps we shouldn't take quite so much for granted. So, what are the epistemological assumptions underpinning English academic discourse then? First of all, it assumes that there exists a world outside ourselves that is objective and neutral, that appears in the same way to everyone, irrespective of culture, language or background. That this world is accessible through our senses, hence the importance of observation, experiment and measurement. And finally, that language serves merely to label this pre-existing external reality. Hence the drive for plainness and simplicity. So it's suggesting then that the linguistic, the categories in our language correspond unproblematically to categories that exist in the outside world. So English academic discourse encodes a particular theory of knowledge in its very structure. And the technical names for this then, so the existence of the outside world that is objective and neutral positivism, accessing the world through the senses, empiricism, and language merely labelling that reality is linguistic realism. And this is the default philosophy in the Anglo-Saxon world. It permeates the culture so thoroughly that most of us aren't even aware that other perspectives exist. And this has been observed by other theorists. For example, Art Berman, in his book about the reception in the United States of, of structuralism and post-structuralism states, in America, controversies are customarily within empiricism. So anything that falls outside is beyond the pale, effectively. While the philosopher Richard Rorty says, the scientific paradigm is so dominant in the Anglo-Saxon world that humanists, such as theologians, philosophers, historians and literary critics, have to worry about whether they are being scientific, whether they are entitled to think of their conclusions, no matter how carefully argued, as worthy of the term true. Now, this empiricist paradigm is the prestige philosophy of the modern world. And it attracts followers because using it brings credibility and funding, of course. But it hasn't always been like this. This is a form of knowledge that is historically contingent. It came into being in a particular cultural context, promoted by a particular community with their own agenda. 
and its dominance today has more to do with the political and economic clout of the countries that promote it than with any intrinsic superiority as a way of explaining the world. Now, in order to explain this better, I think it would be useful to trace its historical development, as this might help to de it and highlight its contingent character. Now, English academic discourse can trace its genealogy back to the scientific revolution of the 17th century, which is when this empiricist mindset was formed. However, it was not implanted in a void. There was another form of scholarship that existed before it, which for some reason many historical linguists have chosen to ignore. Before the scientific revolution, knowledge understood as philosophy resided in words. It was acquired by the exegesis of authoritative texts. Not only scriptures, but also those classical texts that had been assimilated into the system. And by training in the use of language. During the medieval period, the curriculum was dominated by the so-called trivium of grammar, rhetoric and dialectic. While in the Renaissance period, with the arrival of humanism, the arts of verbal expression had an even bigger role to play, though now with a slightly different emphasis. Now it was re rhetoric or the manipulation of words to persuade that took centre stage. So according to Christian humanists, such as Erasmus, language was a civilising force, a God-given faculty which could move men to virtue and bring about peace and justice and liberty. Hence, eloquence was cultivated as an educational discipline and a literary ideal, and abundant speech was valued as an indication of inner worth, as you see from the quotation that I have here from Erasmus, a very, very different attitude to that espoused by modern English academic discourse. Now, in this rhetorical tradition, there were three aspects to language that the effective orator needed to consider. There was logos, which is the referential component, ethos, a moral component, and pathos, an emotive component. There were also three styles that the orator could choose from in accordance with his aim and his public. The grand style, which, which aimed to arouse the audience to a, a state of heightened emotion and placed a great deal of emphasis on the aesthetic dimension with the vast repertoire of tropes and figures. There was a middle style. And then there was a plain style, which was much more simple and functional. Now this language-based knowledge held sway for several hundred years and challenged. But then this all changed after the Reformation. In 16th century England, in the run-up to the scientific revolution, a movement developed known as the anti-Ciceronian movement, which was very critical of the scholastic and rhetorical tendency to focus on form at the expense of content. And this came to a head, to a certain extent, when Francis Bacon published his Novum Organum in 1620, which was a program for a new approach to knowledge that would focus on things instead of words. That would be inductive rather than deductive. That was empirical in that it relied upon experiment and observation, and, crucially, which advocated a plain, the plain style of rhetoric as being the only one appropriate for this new knowledge. Well, similar calls were coming from other significant figures of the culture, for example, Ben Johnson. I would rather have plain, downright wisdom than a foolish and affected eloquence. For what is so furious and bethlem like is a vain sound of chosen and excellent words without any subject of sentence or science mixed. Hobbes. For words are but, are, are but wise men's counters, they do not they do but reckon by them. But they are the many of fools that value them by the authority of an Aristotle, a Cicero, a Thomas, or any other doctor whatsoever is but a man. And love. Methinks those who pretend seriously to search after or maintain truth 
to think themselves obliged to study how they might deliver themselves without obscurity, doubtfulness, or equivocation, to which men's words are naturally liable if care not be taken. And so when the Royal Society was formed in 1660, it actually made the plain style a prerequisite, as Thomas Pratt de uh, describes in his history of the Royal Society. They have exacted from all their members a close, naked, natural way of speaking, positive expressions, clear senses, a native easiness, bringing all things as near the mathematical plainness as they can, and preferring the language of our friends, countrymen, and merchants before that of wit or scholars. So you can see from this um, quotation then, not only is content now being submitted as a form, but also there is a preference for demotic speech, the language of the common people, rather than, um, rather than an erudite or pretentious register. And this feature, of course, is still visible in the style manuals today. Now, it's no coincidence that the early English scientists were Protestants as the sociologist of science, Robert Merton, pointed out in his famous work, Science, Technology and Society in 17th Century England. Because the plain style encoded Protestant virtues, simplicity, economy, precision, an emphasis on concrete things rather than abstractions, which is actually reflected in the grammar, as we shall see. And, importantly, a belief that the plain style was transparent, that it gave direct access to an extra-lingual reality in a completely unmediated way. Now this echoed the distaste for mediation that the Protestants felt in the religious sphere as well. You'll remember that they did away with priests and icons and, and symbols of all kinds in order to be able to access God directly. So the idea here was that the plain style provided access to the truth. Now, I've argued elsewhere that this belief in the truth value of the plain style is very deep-rooted still in Anglo-Saxon cultures, and that it underpins not only English academic discourse, but also the drive for plainness that we can see in many other spheres, such as public administration, journalism, politics. We have, for example, the very vocal plain English campaign. And it's even now moved into the European Commission with the Fight the Fog campaign there. And surprisingly, I believe, it's even espoused by some linguists. The systemic functional linguists have their notion of linguistic congruence, which asserts the naturalness of the relationship between English grammatical categories and the outside world. So here we have Jim Martin. What exactly does it mean to make abstract writing plain? Essentially what we are looking at is the relationship between semantics and grammar, between meaning and form. In plain English there is a natural relationship between the two. Actions come out as verbs, descriptions as adjectives, logical relations as conjunctions, and so on. And here is Halliday. The lexicogrammar is a natural symbolic system. What this means is that both the general kinds of grammatical patterns that have evolved in language and the specific manifestations of each kind bear a natural relation to the meanings that evolved to express. Hence, we have verbs and nouns to match the analysis of experience into processes and participants. Well, personally, I find this extremely Anglo-centric because he's, they're basically asserting a natural relationship between the grammatical categories of English and the outside world. Because there are some languages that don't distinguish between verbs and nouns, processes and participants. Um, I've, two that, I, that, that I've, I've learned about are Salish and Wakashan. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of those. I think they're Eskimo languages. Um, also, Plainness is not valued in the same way everywhere. For example, in the Catholic countries of Southern Europe, the grand style of rhetoric was, was adopted as an identity marker after the Reformation in reaction to what the Protestants were doing. And we can still see the effects of this in the way that academics from those countries write today. It's very problematic for them if they need to, to publish in English, in fact. 
So, personally, I think that Halliday and Martin are being very naive here. And it's all the more surprising as they have been instrumental in deconstructing the truth claims made by English academic discourse. Which is what I want to go on to now. Okay, so here then, I would like to show you some ways in which English academic discourse actually constructs the, the world that it aims to reflect or describe. First, by looking at the notion of objectivity, which is central to the empiricist paradigm, as we've seen, and also by looking at the way facts are created. Now, this notion of fact creation actually, in general English, sounds like something of an oxymoron. Because facts are not usually understood in English to have been created at all. They are understood as being things that exist objectively or have happened, irrespective of human interference. Now, the first point I'd like to make is that objectivity is a linguistic construct and that it has been achieved by two major grammatical metaphorizations. Nominalization, um, the device by, by means of which processes are reconstrued as things. I'm not talking here about simple noun phrases, but something that's very particular to technical discourse. Um, so if you've got, for example, a clause, such as, it's just an example, off the top of my head, really. Um, the wave was travelling very fast. This can then be repackaged as the highway velocity, for example. And the second one, impersonal verb forms. So, um, in particular, the agentless passive. Um, but not only that, also the, um, also the impersonal active as well. Um, and here I'm going to be drawing on the work of Halliday and Martin from their 1993 volume, Writing Science. Now, um, according to Halliday then, nominalizations first appeared in the 17th century in the, writing of, in the writings of Newton. And they've since become a mainstay of scientific discourse because they serve two important functions. First of all, by compressing complex phenomena into a single semiotic entity. They enable the construction of technical taxonomies, which are of course central to the architecture of disciplines. So going back to the example I gave before, we've got terms such as pulse wave velocity, <coughs> shear wave velocity, um, and these can then be expanded indefinitely. Shear wave velocity calculations. Okay, it's recursive. Um, Secondly, these nominalizations also permit information that has been presented in clausal form to be concisely repackaged in subsequent sentences in order to create a discourse that moves forward by logical and coherent steps, each building on what went before. So we've got things like the wave was observed to be travelling very fast, repackaged. This high wave velocity resulted in the generation of, for example. Now this brings implication for rational argument, and also for thematic progression, the internal organisation of the text. Going on to the next one, the impersonal verb forms. As I said, this is not just the agent plus passive, also the impersonal active, when an active verb is used with an inanimate subject. Um, these apparently developed later in the 19th century, and they have a number of different rhetorical functions. They allow the discourse to sound objective and impersonal, of course. They have a universalizing function, removing idiosyncrasy and doubt. They can enhance authority when used to present methods or the results of particular experiments. And they can also emphasize the communality of the scientific project in uh, examples such as its use has received, has revealed encouraging results or more data are required. Things like so together, then, they construct a static, objective, objectively existing world from which the human element has been removed. This is how 
I would say, and Martin describe it. Where the everyday mother tongue of common sense knowledge construes reality as a balanced tension between things and processes, the elaborated register of scientific knowledge reconstrues it as an edifice of things. It holds reality still to be kept under observation and experimented with, and in doing so, interprets it not as changing with time, as the grammar of clauses interprets it, but as persisting, or rather persistence through time, which is the mode of being of an end. So, it turns processes into things and crystallizes experience, but also there are other consequences to this. By removing the human element, removing subjectivity, we've also lost several of those dimensions which were considered to be essential to the rhetorical paradigm. So, emotion, aesthetics and ethics are not considered to be legitimate components of scientific knowledge. The last one, ethics. Um, this came clear to me actually a couple of years ago when I was translating an orthopedics article about animal experiments. And in the method section, we had things like, first, the femur was fractured in three places. Right. I, I mean, that made it clear to me just how much this kind of discourse whitewashes over ethical issues. If we put that back into the active and we remove the technical lexus, we'd have to say something like Professor Smith or, or his technicians broke the dog's leg in three places. No, it's not, not very pleasant. So, so one, of the, one, of the, one of the consequences of this, which I, I think is particularly severe, is the fact that you know, we, we lose the humanity out of knowledge. Now, um, ironically also, rhetorical manipulation, which as we have seen is anathema to the scientific worldview, ironically this has actually persisted in academic writing in even the most hardcore positivistic science texts. And here I'm drawing upon linguists that you certainly know. Um, we know, of course, John Swales' Carr's model for research article introductions, where he describes the moves that a successful author will make um, in promoting his or her work, so establishing a territory, identifying a niche that has not yet been explored, occupying that niche. It's very rhetorical. Um, then other things, such as the construction of writer's stance, the construction of expert identity, the reader in the text, self-promotion devices, and narrative dimensions also. This particular work by Christopher Nash, Narrative in Culture, contains some very interesting chapters about scientific writing as narrative, the use of metaphor and storytelling in economics, for example, the narrative of discovery in science. But what I'd really like to concentrate on here are these last two, epistemic modality and scientific citation and referencing, because it, these impinge upon the second question that I want to deal with here, which is how facts are created. Okay, now epistemic modality is possibly as central to the scientific worldview as nominalizations and impersonal verb forms, because it's the way in which an author can express caution and restraint when making claims, and not only that. Um, so it consists of, as I'm sure you know, hedging devices such as the modals, may, might, could, adverbials perhaps, possibly, attenuating verbs such as appear or suggest. It also includes boosters to express certainty and enhance the force of the proposition. So things are obviously, definitely, of course, modals, will, must, etc. So, um, epistemic modality then offers an outlet for subjectivity and opinion in the most positivistic of texts. And in fact, it goes back a long way. Um, because Robert Boyle impl apparently employed hedging devices in his scientific treatise a decade or so prior to the publication of the first transactions of the Royal Society in 1665. And he even reflected explicitly about this practice as you see in this quotation. Now, um, epistemic modality also serves a number of 
rhetorical purposes. It reflects organized skepticism, which of course is one of the cornerstones of the scientific ethos. And also by carefully distinguishing between fact and opinion, it also reinforces claims to objectivity. It also has a stance creating function, so it projects authorial honesty and modesty, or um, conversely assurance and conviction demonstrates the respect, respect for colleagues' views and readers' face views. It indicates involvement in the topic, solidarity with readers. So in the hands of a competent writer then, hedging and boosting devices may be deftly manipulated to reinforce one's own argument and undermine an opponent's. Also, the exact epistemic device cho chosen, ranging from highly tentative forms such as it would seem, to the categorical assertion of the universalizing present, it is. It may provide an indication of the claim's precise status within the discourse community at a particular time. And in this respect, <coughs> it contributes to the creation of facts. And so, as I've already said, although scientific facts are still broadly understood within our empiricist paradigm, to have objective truth value and to be gradually uncovered in a linear process of discovery. Highland and others have shown that facts are not discovered, but they're created in a social process. And here I have a quotation from Ken Highland. The construction of academic facts as a social process with a cachet of acceptance only bestowed on a claim after negotiation with editors, expert reviewers and journalists. The final ratification granted, of course, with the citation of the claim by others and eventually the disappearance of all acknowledgement as it is incorporated into the literature of the discipline. So, the process of fact creation goes something like this. When a claim or a theory is first made, it will be broached tentatively using hedging devices. If it catches on, it will be quoted by others, initially using reporting verbs such as suggests and argues, and then gradually becoming more assertive, um, perhaps as a direct statement in the body of the text with the author's name appearing in brackets afterwards. As it becomes accepted in the discipline, it no longer becomes necessary to hedge or even to attribute. And so, ultimately, when a claim has made it into a student textbook and is no longer attributed to a, a particular author or presented as a theory, it has effectively become a fact of that discipline, accepted by the community as uncontroversial. So, facts are not uncovered or discovered as the meta discourse of empiricism would have it. They have no objective existence. They are no more than theories that have been consensually accepted by the discourse community. And those that acquire this status can usually only be dislodged by a major paradigm shift that causes things to be seen in a whole new way, as, as, as Tom Scoon talked about in 1962. So can we conclude from all this then that the basis upon which the empiricist paradigm rests is something of a sham? Well, clearly, there is no such thing as an objectively existing reality that appears in exactly the same way to everyone and is gradually revealed through linear and communal, and communal process of discovery. As we've seen, objectivity is a linguistic construct, achieved largely through the use of nominalizations and impersonal verbs. It's also reinforced by devices such as epistemic modality, which carefully distinguish between fact and opinion. Facts have no independent existence. They are merely claims or theories about the world that have achieved consensus in a particular discourse community. And rhetoric is central to this enterprise because only through effective rhetoric can we convince our peers of the plausibility of our claims. As John Swales has said, the art of the matter, as far as the creation of facts is concerned, lies in deceiving the reader into thinking there is no rhetoric and the facts are indeed speaking. Well, I might be preaching to the converted here. I mean, you are all linguists, and many of you, I believe, are specialists in English academic discourse as well. 
So you probably, it's probably no surprise at all to you to learn that the scientific worldview was linguistically constructed and that rhetorical manoeuvres pervade this discourse, even as it claims to be de devoid of such tricks. So my, my issue is not really that rhetoric exists. I mean, I'm a constructivist, so I believe everything is rhetorical. That our perception of all that surrounds us is shaped by our language and our culture, that there's no escaping that, and that it's impossible to be neutral and objective. So my question is this. Why does the myth of objectivity still persist in the academic world? I mean, why is empiricism still a dominant theory of knowledge when its premises are so very shaky? Today, it is so overwhelmingly dominant that even the humanities are being forced into its moulds. When we make applications for funding, we have to we have to make, put our proposal in terms of ca categories which have been derived from science. We have to talk about our methods, our anticipated results, our impact. I mean, what's, what use is that to somebody who basically just reads books and reflects on that? I mean, what is your method? Um, we're obliged to use a discourse that is not so different from the discourse of science in order to achieve credibility. We have to be clear, concise, economical. We have to eschew emotivity and excessive subjectivity. And funding is going more and more to those that use quantitative methods, statistical processes, technology, corpus linguistics, for example. Um, the answer, I think, to the question why is power. The empiricist paradigm of knowledge and the discourse that encodes it are very closely bound up with technology, industry, and capitalism, which are the pillars of power in the modern world. And I guess it's probably going to be impossible to unseat it without unseating them as well. And that, of course, is a revolution that's far beyond the bounds of what we linguistic scholars are able to achieve. Thank you very much.
Um, I make sure that they know how to, to write the target discourse, but um, I would also, I would also um, do contrastive studies. And then I think, um, I think if, we, if we can train a, a new generation that is aware that English, this English academic discourse is not the only way of doing it, then they, they are in a position possibly of influencing others, such as the, the peer reviewers and the editors of journals, the gatekeepers of the culture, you know. Um, and it may then be possible to negotiate things more. So I think the only thing we can do at the moment is awareness raising. Okay. Um, I mean, I've often said that I'm a little bit schizophrenic in my practice because when I translate, I actually domesticate a lot. I mean, I get these Portuguese texts which are, in, you know, incredibly, um, incredibly complex sentences. They go on for a whole the whole page and the main point only comes at the end and um, a lot of emotivity, a lot of figures of speech, a lot of overt rhetoric. Um, I know that if I translated those things literally, they wouldn't get published. And if they didn't get published, I would lose my clients, I'd lose my sources of income. <laughs> so um, so I don't do that, I domesticate. So I put them into a form which I know that the, that the journals are going to accept. But, but I, I try to make this evident to the parties involved. So I will discuss it with the client and I would also try to, to, to make some reference to that in the text or, or to the peer reviewers or something like that. Okay, so it's awareness raising, I think, is the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I understood that we need nominals for object resistance or to help us focus on things. Sorry, we need nominals, nominalizations, nominalizations yeah. nominal items in general. And I was reminded of a study by an American, Native American linguist called Alfred. Uh -huh. And he tried to teach general and special relativity to Native Americans using their native language. Uh -huh. And you mentioned that the categories like verbs, nouns, they are not as clear cut as, let's say, in English. Uh -huh. And he found that they had a better grasp of, these, uh -huh. of modern physics. Well, Halliday, in, in the writing science volume, he has a chapter in which he suggests that this very nominalised scientific discourse that, that we have at the moment is probably not adequate to deal with normal physics. He, he specifically says that. And um, he, he mentions that we might be moving back towards a more causal form and that maybe uh, we might go on. Well, he wrote this in 1993, okay, several years have gone by now. But he, he suggested we might be on the brink of a paradigm shift. Now, a lot of people were talking about this at the end of the last century. But a lot of people were saying, you know, knowledge is changing, we're on the brink of a paradigm shift, everything's going to change. But the thing is, it hasn't happened, has it? Because, I mean, you know, the, I know the theoretical physicists might be off doing their own thing, but mainstream knowledge construction has become, has gone backwards, really. It's, it's become even more solidly empirical and positivistic than it had was before. Yeah. But there is any indication Stephen Hawking, for instance, he Versus he uses the word space time. Yes. He uses yes. as one word. Yes. So. No, I mean, I know theoretical physics for many reasons. Um, but that they don't, I mean, it doesn't use the same categories which we are used to using in, in our classic discourse. Um, and so people have said that maybe a kind of more poetic kind of discourse would be better to express that. Yes, possibly. I mean, I agree that that's probably the case. But I think that's a domain which is, it's a little bit esoteric. It's it's not really the domain that I was talking about here, I was talking about something much more mainstream. And the problems which, kind of, I'm not talking about Stephen Hawking's of the world, really, or Einstein's, or, you know, um, it's the kind of your, your everyday academic who is pressurised by their university and their funding body in order to publish in interna international journals. It's those kinds of people that I'm really concerned with. I mean, it would be very nice if there could be a paradigm shift and we could develop a different discourse. I would prefer that, to be honest. I think that, that would be the way to go, but it doesn't look like it's going like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. I was just wondering, when you're focusing on written academic discourse, whether the spoken academic discourse in English is not, well, is different. Because, I mean, there you would find quite a number of subjects Devices, you would find irony, for instance, you know, the way that knowledge is presented in a spoken mode. And I find the discrepancy quite amazing. Well, there, there obviously there are differences as between all spoken and written discourse. It's obviously going to be looser and more colloquial and, um, and 
and freer in many respects, but I still think it's not radically different. It's still doing the same thing. Um, I mean, my, um, my kind of measure is, is the, the other sorts of discourses which are, which are produced elsewhere, such as I was mentioning at the humanities discourse in Portuguese, Spanish, all the romance cultures do it, um, or the sort of discourse that was produced before the scientific revolution, which, which those were radically different. You know, as I said, they were based on a different theory of knowledge. And I don't think, um, I don't think modern oral, oral academic discourse is really based on a different epistemological framework. It's the same framework, but it's just got more interactive elements to it just because of the, the situation in which it's used, I think.